The following documentary contains material that some viewers may find unsuitable. Discretion is advised. This program is based on factual events and features a series of reenactments with live action actors and computer simulations. This program is intended for educational use. Walt Disney World, Orange County, Florida. The Walt Disney World monorail system opens at the Florida Resort in 1971. Originally operating the Austin Whitmere Mark IV monorail, the system opened with two routes, expanding to three in 1981 and switching to Bombardier Transportation's Mark VI monorail in 1989. Servicing two theme parks and three resort hotels, the system's Express and Epcot lines are connected by a spur track located northeast of the Transportation and Ticket Center. Opening before and closing after the parks, the monorail system is far accustomed to long hours and heavy ridership. July 5th, 2009. After one of the resort's busiest days of the year, two monorails are on a collision course. Monorail Purple is stopped on the track while a second train is heading straight towards it. After the violent collision, several persons aboard Monorail Purple are injured. The pilot fatally. How did this collision occur? Was the cause technical, mechanical, or human in nature? What went wrong? Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those vital seconds from disaster. July 4th, 2009. It's Independence Day, a time of celebration and one of Walt Disney World's busiest days of the year. Nonetheless, cast members have a job to do, and this is especially true for maintenance and engineering personnel. Taking the day off is Tuan Ha. With over five years on the job, he is one of five experienced service managers in charge of the Walt Disney World monorail system. The managers are in charge of all monorail mechanical, maintenance, and electrical issues. It is this group who is called when a ride component fails or when a computer error automatically shuts off power to the track. Ha is primarily responsible for the switch beams 8 and 9, which are used to transfer monorails from the main to the spur track. 5 p.m. July 2nd, Manager Ha clocks out in preparation for his holiday weekend. He has serviced beams 8 and 9 that day. July 4th, 6 a.m. The pink monorail train is put into service for the business day. It will join seven other monorails on the track, including Monorail Purple. To manage this many trains on the track, Walt Disney World employs patented safety technology. Known as the Moving Block Light System, or MAPO, short for Mary Poppins, the system features three lights, green, amber, and red, and a push-button labeled Override, located in the pilot's cab of every monorail train. The currently illuminated MAPO color indicates how far ahead the leading train is currently located. Each monorail beam is divided into blocks based upon pylon numbering. Each block is roughly between 500 and 1,000 feet in length. A green maple light shows that the leading train is three or more blocks ahead. Amber means two, and red means the train is in the very next block. Monorail pilots are extensively trained on the MAPO system and are instructed to hold short when receiving an amber or red MAPO light. A red maple light will also occur when the pilot approaches a section of unpowered beam, a spur line, or a switch beam thrown in the direction of a spur, as would be the case at the Transportation Center station when beams 8 and 9 are activated at the end of the night. 5.30 p.m. Weather reports into the Walt Disney World Resort indicate that around 2 a.m. decreased visibility will occur due to fog and humidity in the area. Monorail pilots will have to be especially cautious, as the added humidity will make it even harder to see from inside the cab as the monorail windows become fogged up. The monorail pilots will have to rely even more heavily on the MAPO system. 7.30 p.m. Alan Rubino is now on the clock. He will be driving the pink monorail train this evening. He has worked for Disney since 2007. 
Alan is a full-time Walt Disney World monorail pilot. 11.45 p.m. Austin Wennenberg, a 21-year-old casual temporary cast member, has been with Disney since 2006, working during summers and other breaks. He and other casual temporary cast members fill in when the regulars are unavailable. He will be working a four-hour shift this evening. Throughout the evening, things go smoothly as passengers are dropped off and picked up repeatedly by the different monorails. From monorail pilot Austin Wunnenberg's point of view, things are going smoothly this evening until 1.59 a.m. Holding short of the Ticket and Transportation Center station, pilot Wunnenberg can only look out his windscreen as he sees monorail lights headed straight towards him. Processing the fact that a train is headed straight towards him, Wunnenberg desperately tries to throw his monorail purple into reverse. But just seconds later, impact occurs. It is um, medical. Um, transportation and ticket center monorail station. It was a head on collision. This head on collision resulted in the injury to several passengers aboard the Purple Monorail, as well as the fatality of 21 year old monorail pilot Austin Wunnenberg. How did this incident occur? The Florida Division of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and the National Transportation Safety Board lead a joint investigation. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration's investigation will focus on safety violations, while the National Transportation Safety Board's investigation will focus on the actual cause of the accident that killed 21-year-old pilot Austin Wunnenberg. NTSB investigators have the unenviable task of finding out what went wrong and how 21-year-old pilot Austin Wannenberg was killed in a monorail collision. The investigators interview several witnesses and several on-duty personnel, including shop panel operator Michael Carr, monorail pink driver Alan Rubino, off-duty maintenance service manager Tuan Ha, and a monorail guest service manager on duty. David Gilmore. Investigators will also pull raw data from the monorails themselves, as well as the track, control panel, and other elements of the ride. To better understand normal operating procedure, they also pull excerpts from the monorail operations manual and other checklists that are performed on a daily basis. From interviews with mechanical supervisor Tuan Ha, it is clear Ha thinks the mechanical components of the ride did not fail, including the MAPO safety system and switch beams 8 and 9, which he had tested before departing for the weekend on July 2nd. It is possible, however, that the switch beams 8 and 9 or other mechanical components of the monorail might have failed in the period between Ha's clocking out on July 2nd and the time of the accident on July 5th. Ha has no plausible response for why, when the shop operator said he turned the switch, the beams failed to activate. Corresponding data verifies that between the time the shop panel operator announced over the radio that beams 8 and 9 had been activated and the accident, beams 8 and 9 had not moved. Investigators next turn their attention to shop operator Mike Carr, to verify that he had indeed activated the switch to move beams 8 and 9 into position. Had beams 8 and 9 been in proper place, Rubino's pink train would have switched tracks, thereby avoiding colliding with monorail purple. Interviews with shop panel operator Mike Carr indicate Mr. Carr was asked by Monorail Central Coordinator David Gilmore to activate and move switch beams 8 and 9. Carr tells investigators he energized the beams, called Monorail Central Coordinator Gilmore to advise beams 8 and 9 were still on the spur line with power, and minutes later after hitting the switch, contacted Monorail Central again, this time to inform Central that beams 8 and 9 were now on the main line, and it was now safe for Monorail Pink to reverse through the concourse. Investigators press on asking if Mr. Carr had observed the panel and observed everything in working order. 
Carr responds that the panel did confirm that the beams had moved into proper position. The appropriate lights and blinking were illuminated and sounding at the time of the transfer. Carr responds that all technical indicators were consistent with beams 8 and 9 being locked and in position for a transfer from the spur to the main track. Next, investigators interview pink monorail pilot Alan Rubino. Rubino verifies Carr's radio version of events, indicating he was advised by Central to reverse in Mapo override through Zone 9 and 8 to base to the Grand Floridian and to switch ends. Pilot Rubino informs investigators that both shop panel operator Carr and Central Coordinator Gilmore advised him that the switches were properly activated and he was clear to transfer tracks. Rubino informs investigators that using MAPO override, the maximum speed of reversing a monorail train is 15 miles an hour. Rubino's train was going 15 miles an hour at the time of the accident. He acknowledges that due to weather conditions, his visual was blurry because of the windscreens and lack of cameras. Rubino acknowledges that at this point he is driving on trust and feel alone. He has no one outside to tell him where he's going, and his windscreen is practically unusable. Still, data indicates he is slowing through 15 miles per hour. After 40 seconds and with nothing to tell him otherwise, Rubino now believes he is off the Epcot spur line and back on the main line. But just as Rubino commences his call to inform Monorail Central of his supposed position, 